Good afternoon and welcome to the Meetup on Air webcast hosted by Core BTS. Today's presenters are Jeff Lockwood, Managing Architect at Core BTS, and Ed McElroy, Senior Solution Architect at Core BTS. In this technology roadmap event, you'll learn how to take advantage of the new collaborative experience on virtually any device, anytime, anywhere. A couple of quick logistical items before we begin. First, you'll notice a chat feature in the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We'll be taking your comments and questions throughout the webinar for a quick Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Just to the right of that, you'll notice a scheduling module. Please feel free to use that to schedule a more in-depth conversation with a core BTS representative after the event. As a thank you for taking this additional step, you'll receive an Amazon.com gift card, which will be sent to you following your meeting. So with that, let's get started with our program. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, as an introduction, my name is Jeff Lockwood. I'm a managing architect with Core BTS. Uh, and my focus is primarily on uh, data center and cloud solutions. Um, joining me is Ed McElroy. Um, Ed's one of our senior principal solutions consultants, um, focus on enabling a lot of the technologies we're going to be speaking about today. So we're going we're gonna to start in. We're going to cover some, some trends that we're seeing uh, in, the, uh, in the market. We'll talk about some transitions that's happening. Um, we'll, we'll then move to what that means from an from a IT organization perspective. How do we enable some our organization or your organization to move along with these trends? So we'll just get started right into it. And what we're seeing in the market is we're in the middle of a market transition from the PC era to the cloud era. And we're seeing that across the board, that users are now moving away from the traditional PC model, where that's their device, to more of a mobility model, um, more of their data, more of their applications, more of what they are accessing is in a cloud model. This next slide here is really um, informative for us, right? So we're entering a time when m more mobile units will be sold uh, in the market and, and then PCs. As a matter of fact, I think Gartner predicts next year there will be more devices from a mobile perspective, i.e. iPad type devices, whether they're tablets or uh, smartphones than there are um, PCs being shipped. And that's that's the first time that that shift has happened. Um, and we're seeing that and predicted to, to do that um, next year, 2014. Um, today, smartphones, tablets, and, and, and the emerging Internet of Things, uh, that's the result of the latest round of innovation, right? So we can do things in society today that we weren't able to do 20 years ago uh, so technology has really become embedded uh, in our lives, in our everyday lives. It's a major force of change. Another statistic, by 2014, 40%, 50% of all workloads um, will be moved to a cloud model versus a traditional data center model. And, and the traditional data center model has been one workload per one resource. So an application uh, workload assigned to a specific uh, server or a specific set of technology storage, right? Um, so 2015 is when we'll really see um, that to, uh, you know, emerge. Right? It starts in next year and, you know, about 57% of the workload is, is forecasted to be in some kind of cloud delivery model, right? Now, we're not going to go through, you know, the, you know the, all the cloud models. There's, there's different versions. That, that cloud could be one that you deliver in a private function, um, meaning it's dedicated to just your company. It could be one that you send out to the public cloud, and it could be a combination, right? If you have, a, I'm working with a client, Ed and I are actually working with a client that they want to develop their private cloud, but they don't want to be in the business of hosting a data center. So they're going to give that to someone else, but they want the, some of the control um, that a private cloud would give IT, uh, along with um, some of the flexibility that you can deliver to your organization. 
We're going to stop here real quick um, and going to send out a, our first polling question. Um, as we do that, I'll, I'll continue with the uh, presentation, but we're just curious of where you guys are at uh, in that transition as far as you know, moving to that cloud. So as, as, as the technology transitions are happening, the role of IT is changing um, within uh, the organization. It's not just CIOs that are the primary decision makers um, anymore. CEOs and CFOs are getting more involved in IT decision making. Um, role of IT really become more strategic. We do a, a ton of uh, strategy workshops with our clients. And an interesting fact that uh, we just realized this last quarter, nearly 42% of the discussions we're having around our strategy um, and advisory services are not necessarily with just the CIO. They are with the CFOs, the CEO, and the CIO as well. And, and, and it makes sense, right, because technology isn't just about a bunch of gearheads or application people delivering stuff, right? Because everybody in the organization is a user or an enabler. So the CEO, he values IT, what it can do for the company. You know, it can be a competitive advantage. The CFO, that's the individual that's funding IT. So they're involved with those decision making. The chief marketing officer, we're having more and more conversations with chief marketing officers because they're the ones that are just really taking IT and and enabling that to become a vehicle um, for the organization. So, so they're really emboldened by the power of what IT can do. And of course the CIO, along with his, his peers or her peers, they're, they're responsible for building out that IT. So m much more uh, IT has become much more strategic. And CIOs have a larger role to play, quite frankly, around governance and management and, and how they can enable um, revenue enhancements and, and emergence in a new market and, and the discussion is really around how, how do these new technologies that we're seeing, uh, how do they enhance my business? Some of those driver for change, right? So um, one of them is, uh, actually I'm going to stop right here. We have uh, the results of our first polling and it says 50% say I don't have a cloud strategy. 50% says I'm working on one. Okay, so it's half and half, if I'm reading that right. Good. So some of the drivers for change that, um, that we're seeing, right? So business demands, they want everything now. Um, they want anytime access. Uh, several of our clients uh, are, are dealing with that BYOD or CYOD that's out there. And that's driving that choice of devices, right? IT, however, is working within their traditional constraints. Uh, reduce the costs, security and compliance, and, and, and these manual processes that are in a traditional IT shop. Um, so as CIOs want to become and are becoming more strategic, these drivers are what we're seeing they have to deal with in this new environment. So I often get the conversation with, with CIOs when Ed and I and our teams are, are, are engaged is, what, what does the cloud do? Should I, should, I, should I get all of these servers, my development over into the cloud and just let them handle it? Um, do, do I do a platform as a service for, for this thing and instead of building it out my own? Um, lots of us are using software as a service. Salesforce.com is, is an example. They've been in this cloud for a very long time. Um, and, and my answer is none of them, right? So, you know, if you have a cloud strategy, um, that's the thinking we're going to have. And instead, we should really be having the conversation around, I want to deliver IT as a service strategy. And, and I'll enable any of those um, through becoming a broker, essentially. I want to be able to do that for my end users and empower them in a way that they're, they're more engaged, but I, I, I'm not going to be so hung up on, on where it lives or if it's storage or servers. I want to be that broker of service. So the ultimate goal is the delivery of self-service, of any cloud service, whether they're being hosted by your organization, whether they're being served up in a public infrastructure, or whether they're, they're being served up with a combination of the two. Right? There's this, there's this concept out and this trend in the enterprise today of this uh, you know, IT application service vending machine. 
and, it, and that's the place where the port, where, uh, it's a portal where my users can come that will integrate with my backend system and they can come and choose the type of service delivery that they get. We're working with a CIO and he wants to enable that um, and, and the users don't really necessarily care where it's at. And quite frankly, he said, and I don't either. I want to be able to manage that service delivery um, without having to worry about um, where it's delivered. That's done by architecting policy and risk into it. Um, but two, two, um, two comments from Gartner and, and Forrester, and I think it sums it up pretty well. Forrester says a cloud is not a cloud unless the consumers of those services can trigger their own deployment. Right? So think about that. My first cloud, um, this was six plus years ago, but my first cloud project started when my CIO came to me with a literally a bill from marketing. And um, I was new to the company in charge of architecture and engineering. And at the time, we just couldn't deliver services fast enough. It was a very large multinational company. And he, he said, we need to be able to do this. And we were telling marketing and, and marketing's partnership, uh, partner developers, that it would take weeks for us to give you the platforms that you want for, for this new um, application you want to deliver. Uh, and they said, well, we can't wait. And they were able to do that. When I sat down with the vice president of marketing, he said, Jeff, I was able to do what you couldn't do in a day. And most of that time was spent discussing should we do it, right? It wasn't actually doing it. Um, so provisioning portals, very, very important. Um, back end, you know, they have to have integration with your service catalog, right? Um, some of our customers are, are seeing the, the benefit of these portals and in in, in, in intuitively being able to deliver that to their users. They're able to offer new services quicker um, and they're, if they have an existing service catalog. So some of those benefits are that I can deliver agility to my end users and I can respond quickly. And, and I, as IT, have more control, actually. There is this fear um, within a lot of IT organizations of enabling my users to be able to go out and self-service, right, um, for, for a variety of reasons. But the reality is when I do that, I have more control and structure over my systems as a technologist. So it, it gives me that ability to do that. And, and with our clients that we've been working with for a few phases through this transformation, they're coming back to us and saying, you know what? My clients, my user base is now more engaged with my technology organization on what they want us to deliver and what services they want us to provide. So there is a benefit in doing that. And how do we do that, right? Um, that's this concept of that software defined data center, right? Um, we, we've got to get out of the uh, notion that I have a data center on the west coast and a data center on the east coast and there's this geography and this very traditional <clears throat> DR replication, right? Um, you, you, you want to stretch your data center across your organization. Right? So we're working with a company that has multinational, they have data centers in North America, Europe, and, and in Asia. Uh, and they want the user experience to be seamless no matter where they're at. So they have a lot of international travelers. So whether that individual's in their office, whether that individual's in, in, in a European office or, or North American or Asian market, they want it to be one user experience. And that software-defined data center is how you do that, right? We all have been her hearing the architecture around the software-defined networking and, and what that means. So software-defined data center is similar to that. It's all infrastructure is virtualized and delivered as a service. And the control of that data center is entirely automated by software. So we, we've made the consolidation to server virtualization. That's pretty standard. So the next part of that is virtualizing the entire infrastructure, um, my storage, and my networking. And then wrapping that around with automations. Right? I, I, the less human involvement that we have, um, the better a software-defined data center really functions, right? Because there is this, there's this service lag between service request and service delivery. So if I'm a user, I'm requesting something, and then some humans have to go and interact, and then I'm going to deliver it. 
the notion between a software defined data center that's really client driven is I'm going to remove that lag and there's things I'm going to demand, deliver on demand as needed. And really, what does that require? Right? It's, it's not just I'm going to go and get a converged infrastructure or I'm going to move some applications into the cloud. Um, there's not a really a technology um, inhibitor that would allow uh, an organization to do that. Right? Uh, there, there's nothing out there. It's really a transformation. Um, and it's it, it's a cultural transformation inside an IT organization, quite frankly, of how we think of delivering services, and and what that requires us to do is is move away from the concept of delivering servers, or storage, or networking, uh, and and delivering clouds. Quite frankly, I'm going to deliver my services in in a in a unique way that's delivered up through the clouds. It's taking a look at our existing applications, right? So not there's a difference between a an application that can live in the cloud and an application that is developed for the cloud, right? So there's there's new types of apps that are delivered to the clients, you know, and and there's a transition in our customers that they can have for their first time. <clears throat> they get to choose what kind of applications they can consume, and and they have a lot of choices in how they consume it. Um, big data is another um, huge transformation that's going to impact this. And as we said when we started this, there's a transformation from this PC age um, to this mobile user age. Um, and and it's, it's transforming how our users engage with their applications um, and, and, and uh, how, how that happens, right? So Ed, I think we have a question about um, you know what vendors are really driving this? What 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 vendors and what partners are really driving this transformation? Yeah, great question. I mean, it's really not a single vendor that's driving this transformation. It's really a combination of vendors. I mean, you have vendors such as EMC, uh, VMware, Citrix, NetApp. What they're doing is they're combining their resources to develop these solutions that are based on referenced architectures much along the lines of what you said before, which is based on the application, the type of application, the workloads, and that IT tra strategy they're trying to develop, whether it's infrastructure as a service, platform of a service, or software as a service. So again, it's really a combination of these, uh, of these vendors that are coming together, utilizing their development uh, know-how and expertise to develop these solutions. And what we do here at Core BTS, we have a suite of uh, advisory services offerings. Where we uh, where we come and sit down and conduct workshops with our customers, and we develop we help them assist them with their assessment and analysis of the specific approach that they're trying to achieve, and based and honest and what we want to do is understand what they want to achieve and then match that to their business and their technical requirements so they have the right solution that's effective that can be managed that can be implemented in an effective cost costly and effective uh, manner. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. Um you made a good point. You know, there's there's not it's not one technology provider that's got really the whole thing figured out. Um, I, I think there are are some partners out there that are, are very much forward thinking and thought leaders around it. Um, you know, we as Ed alluded to, we we, we really try and start um, with a problem solving. You know, we have partnerships with uh, partner partnerships with other vendors that we solve those problems with, um, and and. and to be clear, not everything is developed and, and is the right fit for a cloud. You know, we, we meet with some organizations, and we just had this conversation I think, two weeks ago, and it was with the CFO and a CIO, and, and they said, I want to move everything to the cloud. And, and, and that, you know, that's, that's not quite possible, um, certainly not on a timeline of I want to do it by next Thursday, um, which was the comment. I want to get everything out into the cloud. Um, and I want to do it quickly. And and there's some integration that CIOs you know understand are there that not the, the entire business doesn't, right? So it's really taking a look at what makes sense, it's, and it's mapping out that strategy for you, right? Um, and there's some things that I want to build. I might be, want to be able to build that capability within my organization uh, and deliver those type of cloud services, um, but I don't want to be in the business of you know hosting all the storage or doing everything like that. And and, and one of the top questions I get is, 
how does that happen? And it's really, it's not, like we said, it's not a technical issue. It, it, it's a cultural organizational issue, typically with NIT. Um, and it's a transformation in our thinking of how we deliver services. Uh, it's us becoming a service broker to our organization um, and not just an infrastructure shop or an application development shop and or, or any shop, so to speak, that's centered around um, particular applications or we're a mainframe shop or we're an x86 shop or whatever. We're a service delivery shop and we're going to deliver the best services based on optimized cost, um, data, usage, satisfaction, lots of factors. But like, you know, take what Ed's saying, not one particular vendor um, has every piece of the puzzle. So it's usually a multi-vendor approach. Um, and really, this drive to um, in, uh, more enabled and engaged user has much more to do with just a diverse end-user landscape, right? So you, you have these younger generations that, that are more cutting edge on what they'll do with technology and the risk that they'll willing to take with technology. Um, so we, we do have a, a multicultural in a lot of organizations and a multi-generational uh, user landscape, but that's that's not really the driver, right? So we're seeing organizations have to deal with corporate devices, um, multiple locations, uh, and personal devices, right? So we talked about BYOD when we started about that. BYOD is bring your own device. We're also seeing CYOD is choose your own device, right? So maybe I don't want to open it up completely, but I'm going to give you some choices. So we're seeing that start to emerge. Um, so we have to deal with not only multiple devices, but multiple platforms. Whether it's Windows platform, whether it's an Android platform, or whether it's an iPhone, you know, an, an Apple platform, some users' personas may have all of them that they're interfacing with. And their data is now located in different locations. Just met with a CTO this week um, that he wants to solve his Dropbox issue, as he calls it, right? Because the, that's the personal cloud that we're going to be talking about. The users have the ability to put their data out there and, and, and have it follow them. Um, so they have data everywhere now. Um, it's, it's not just inside my corporate walls. Uh, and, and diverse applications, whether it's software as a service I'm interfacing with, some enterprise applications, or, or mobile applications. It's, it's much more uh, diverse, diversity, diversified uh, platform, data, and applications. So this brings us to our next polling question. Uh, I, I'd like to know how many of you really are, are working on a BYOD, um, whether it's a strategy, whether it's a project in flight, whether it's um, something that we're going to be doing in the future. Um, we'd like to know that. So that, that whole diverse platform of devices, data, and applications leads us to um, what, what the, you know, the market's calling a personal cloud. And, and, and what is a personal cloud, really? It, it's a cloud-based platform that I have control over, um, where I interface uh, with the cloud. And, and it's a place for my data, my applications, and my preferences. And, and, and I manage that. Uh, I manage my connections. I manage my communications. And I manage my relationships on my terms, right? And, and, and I use, you know, I'll use Facebook and MySpace. Um, I do a lot of work with youth. I primarily choose to interface with my social network with Facebook, but I also choose to do it with MySpace because I still have youth on there, right? So we have, we have those choices um, are mine to make, right? Um, Netflix and Hulu, and I'm not sponsoring any one over the other. I choose to use Netflix because I just don't understand Hulu, but I, can, I have a choice of how I want to interface with my video. And that's really what a personal cloud is. And, and the reality, this is not something new. We have been working with personal clouds for a long time. Um, so it gives us control over our terms, uh, over our applications, and over our data, how we want to interact with that. Uh, and do we want to build a personal cloud, right? Does IT really want to do that? The, the reality is, yeah, you're probably going to do that. You're probably going to move to that, um, that kind of uh, personal cloud um, because of that concept of an application, you know, vending machine or an application portal, right? Um, how I deliver those clouds, that portal is just an interface. We have one in core BTS um, that we enable for our clients that when they engage us, um, 
through our managed services and cloud offerings, we, we uh, or offer them a portal. And they can come and consume um, applications, resources on demand uh, as they see fit. We're seeing that move more to the enterprise. Uh, you know, that's a trend we're seeing where I want to be able to deliver this concept of an application or a services portal, really, where my users can inter interact and interface and, and, and consume these services um, as they need them. Um, so do, do we have a personal cloud? The answer is yes. We've all, we've all been interacting um, with applications for years now, and we've been driving our own personal cloud. Going around IT, um, we've been doing that, right? And what's happened? Well, whether it's Dropbox or, or, or um, whether it's um, you know, Facebook, whatever the, per the cloud application that I'm interacting with, there's a commercial version emerging, right? So <laughs> there's opportunity for, for enterprise organizations, especially to be able to not, to be able to embrace that, right? To be able to embrace that with their user community be able to embrace that and engage with their users. And so how do I get started there? Simple. I've got to simplify my infrastructure management. Um, not the concept of I've got to consolidate my server infrastructure, uh, but everything across the board. I've, I've got to be able to virtualize my entire infrastructure platform. Uh, I've got to be able to use automation and orchestration to do much of the service delivery as possible. Um, and, and really, this is an opportunity as I'm going through this for the CIO and our senior architects to become even more strategic in enabling this. Um, it's, it's not you know, devaluing IT um, in, by any sense of the imagination, um, but it's, it's turning IT into a more strategic component for the business. So I've got to simplify my infrastructure. I've got to get to the concept of I want to automate and orchestrate as much as I can possibly do through uh, the channels. I want to empower my users with self-service. Right? I want to be able to allow them to consume the services that they need um, for the particular workload on demand. And what I mean by particular workload, there may be different personas within your organization um, that need different types of service delivery from IT, right? I may have a marketing persona that needs a certain set of services to drive them that nobody else in the organization would need, but they do need it. And, and using that example within marketing, I may have different personas, whether it be executive management and analyst, within that, that particular persona that they need different services delivered to them, right? And it doesn't, listen, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to build this um, Amazon or Google-like cloud, right? Because that's, that's not reality for many clients. The, the shift has to be, I want to deliver this service, and I'm going to make sense of the best way to do so. Um, so I'm going to become that broker for my clients, that internal broker, right? I, if, I, if I have the ability to deliver it, and we agree that the risk is such that um, I need to keep it inside, then I'll, and I'll enable that service delivery model within my organization. But some things I'll, I'll, I'll let be consumed outside. And deliver anything as a service. Again, this is a, this is a, a mindset change, right? Shifting away from um, applications and, and, and infrastructure and security. And uh, I want to deliver anything as a service. So it's going to take this shift in thinking uh, from a technology perspective, how do I become that broker? How do I become um, you know, that, that, that partner with the business to enable that? You know, Ed made mention of these services that we deliver around workshops. And, and, and the way we're successful delivering these workshops in a, in a, you know, in a one to three days is because we, we, we don't go and meet and talk with the business and then come back and say, hey, this is what the business said. Or we don't go and talk to IT and go to the business, this is what they said. We get them in the room together. And you know, it's a, it's a joke that we say, but we, we start a fight in the room and then we facilitate it, right? We get the discussion going so that it, all parties are just being truthful and honest with them, each other. Um, but it, it takes a shift. It takes an, an absolute shift. Um, 
it requires a new architecture, new skills, new cultures, and quite frankly, new partners um, that can deliver that to you. All right, so I think um, that, that, yep, that's, a, that's the wrap up. This is, moves us into our Q&A session. Uh, and I think we're going to open up the chat uh, for a few questions uh, from the audience. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff, Ed. Uh, if you have any additional questions, guys, please feel free to enter them in the chat module on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We did have a couple that have already come in. Uh, the first comes from Mike E. What is the first step an organization should take if moving to the IT as a service model? Yeah, good question. Um, I, I want to reiterate it's not a technology enabler or technology inhibitor out there. It, it's making the decision as an IT organization that we want to so move to that model. So that's the first step, right? Um, it's, it's developing a roadmap to get there, but it's really making the decision. I want to move to this model um, and I want to become that service delivery organization. Uh, and, and, and I'm not afraid to be able to say, I'm not good at delivering this service, or I don't want to be good at delivering this service, and I'm going to choose a partner to deliver it on my behalf. Right? Um, and then really understanding what you can do and when. Right? There's some things you can do right away. So when, what we typically do is we, we, we discuss capabilities and not technology with our clients. So really understanding the capabilities that you want to be able to deliver the services that you want to be able to offer, right? Outside of technology, making sure that they align up with the business. And then we can start talking about what are the constraints and challenges to delivering that. And that's where the conversation will move to, you know, I don't want to be into that business or I'm not very good at doing that, so I want to, I want to outsource it um, and give it to somebody else to do. I want to comment though, when, when, when organizations make that decision, you're not, you're, you're, you're not, unresponsible, right? So you're still responsible. You're just transferring some of that work or some of that risk. But the responsibility is still yours um, to deliver. Um, so that, that's really the first first part of it is making the decision. I want to deliver it. And then understanding where they're at from capabilities. What, what capabilities do I want to deliver? What can I deliver today? And then really just road mapping that out. Good question. Awesome. We have another one that came in from Jeremy. He says, uh, can you, Core BTS, deliver the workshops locally? Uh, well, it, I guess that would depend on where you're local. If you're in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, probably not. Um, but yeah, our, our teams are, are pretty dispersed. Um, I'm actually, I live in the south. I live in Tennessee. I'm up in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, Ed and his team are helping. We're doing a couple workshops up here. The next couple of weeks, I'll be in the Nashville area, um, and then you know we're we're going to I don't know wherever New York somewhere Ed uh, over the next three weeks. So yeah, we we, we we our teams are in each region, and um, we come to the clients. Right, um, Ed will work with me, and his team will will pull will get pulled in to uh, you know deliver. We we like to use our technology either on dog food. So there's always going to be someone locally there um, at the whiteboard. Uh, and there's always going to be at least a few resources uh, through video. Uh, we have one we're doing this Thursday. We're actually bringing the client to one of our locations in our ACR um, and then bringing their other business partners who aren't in market where we're at in through video and collaborating with an office in the Midwest, an office on the East Coast, um, one of their offices in Latin America, and local uh, Midwest client, right? Um, so yeah, you know, I, I would I would say get with whoever your account manager is at Core. Uh, if you're interested in doing more of those, uh, and you know, the workshops that, and we have a we have a framework we use and an agenda, but and we we usually start that off with a conversation with the client because it's really the client's agenda, not ours. Um, so we share it with them, um, and and we develop it uh, a little bit more detail around it. Thanks. And we have another question from a guest. Uh, what is an appropriate time frame to make this cultural transition? <laughs> uh, you know, that I'm, I'm, we're doing a workshop with um, a client tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Um, and it, it, it depends on the organization, right? Uh, I know that some businesses are very understanding that I'm not going to get there. Um, very quickly, 
we're working at this particular organization, they're thinking out further. So for them, um, we're six months into it, and really the goal is by the end of Q1 2014 to be at this cultural um, setting where we're delivering IT as a service. Now, it also depends on the size of the organization. That's a very entrepreneurial they're not a startup, but the spirit is very um, entrepreneurial, and they, they want to have the ability to, to turn with the market conditions. So some of that culture was already in there. Just IT's catching up. Now, the larger the organization, the longer it takes. When I did this for a corporate client, when I was on the corporate side, uh, this shift took us at about two years, to be honest with you. From, and that was just IT, making this shift from this traditional... Um, traditional IT workshop you can think of, or traditional IT organization, to uh, more of a service delivery model. And, and keep in mind, for, for the leaders on the phone, some people aren't going to like this new model, and that's reality, and, and they may self-select to, to not participate. Uh, some are going to embrace it and want to acquire new skills and, and be thought leaders and drivers of this new new. Uh, the new, the new organization. It's a good, good question. So it, it, it really, it, that's the long answer. To, it depends on the organization. Now, I've seen them happen as short as a six months. Um, some are, are years in the making. You know, change, whether it's good or bad, is, is irrelevant. Change is difficult um, to, to do. You know, if you're, if you're a leader on the phone and you're thinking about doing that, I would highly encourage everybody to, on your team to read Who Moved My Cheese. That, that'll help get them started the right thinking process. Good question. And we have another from a guest. What would be entry-level metrics for IT to be measured as a broker? Entry-level metrics. Hmm. Let me. I want to make sure I understand it. So, entry-level metrics in the terms of service delivery, or entry-level metrics in the terms of specific um, KPIs that you already have, right? Um, there, there's two. Um, there's the traditional KPIs of availability and um, application of performance and all that stuff that you still have to measure. Um, I think that good metrics um, for an IT organization to really understand is um, that lag between service request and service um, delivery, right? Um, and that's across the board. It's not, it's not just with a help desk ticket entering in and I'm repairing something. Uh, it's it's service. So if it's it could, that service could be, I'm requesting something be repaired. I'm requesting new server infrastructure. I need a new application to change the way my business unit goes to market. So what's the lag, and do I have the ability to shorten that lag? Um, so taking a look at that for sure. Um, taking a look at your engagement with the um, the business, right? Um, we use a metric here, it's called Net Promoter Score. We didn't invent it, we're, we're consumers of it. Net Promoter Score is the first that I encourage my clients to, to start with, right? Uh, and what it is, it, 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 it's a survey. Um, it's, uh, you can go Google it and look it up, and it's based on the golden question, you know, would you recommend our services, really? Uh, that's where we, we start. We, we start with, would you recommend our services? For, for large organizations and we get a baseline and then um, what we see is we want to move this baseline, we want to move it north um, and getting the entire IT organization around that metric, it's a customer sat. So my goal and my share um, behavior changing metric is around customer satisfaction and not necessarily delivering a server or delivering a storage device or, or delivering anything, right? If you start to just track that metric around customer sat, um, then the mindset can start to change. Because that, again, frankly, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, I can turn a team loose, or Ed can turn a team loose, and depending on the size, from a technology perspective, anywhere from 90 days to one year, the largest organization, have a full functioning cloud done. And stuff migrated over. Um, but we, we've also seen nobody use that so because because you have to change that thinking. Great question. Yeah, and if I could add to that, Jeff, I mean, I think you yeah. hit the nail on the head. It's that customer sat is that perfect entry-level metric because 
as you as you develop that cloud, as you develop that environment to deliver IT as a service, platform as a service, everyone is becoming your customer. So it's how you're servicing their needs and how you're being responsive to them. And I think that's the perfect entry level metric. Obviously, on the back end, you're going to be looking at time provision and things like that from the team that's going to be managing that environment. But I think the ultimate the ultimate uh, uh, entry level metric to look at is how how quickly are you satisfying your customers' requests? And the customer is everybody else out in the in the industry mm -hmm. in the co company rather. Yeah, and and it's a good point. And, and you you made a comment made me think of another one that. Um, it's not the first one, but it's like number two. And that's really how, how well my organization does vendor management, right? Especially if you're moving to this cloud model where you're not necessarily controlling all of the components of that service, but you have to control the relationship and, and the delivery mechanism, right? So, you know, all up and down the chain, not just at the management level, but, but driving it down, we have to get our team members better uh, at, at overall vendor management um, to do that. And then, and then behind that one, you know, cost. You know, how, do I really know how much it costs, right? You be, moving to the cloud at certain levels does not save you money. If I want to move everything to Amazon, there's this misconception um, that it can, I'm not saying it can't do it, moving everything to like a public cloud for certain organizations can be you know, save you money just from a cost perspective on, on those infrastructure platforms, but not always the case, right? Um, there, so really understanding what's the cost of me delivering this service internally first, as then understanding all the components that come into delivering that externally. So that's another good metric I would look at, you know, the customer service, customer sat, vendor management, and cost management. Really understanding that. Good question. Great question, some great answers there. Um, I know there's a lot more to delve into. We have, I'll uh, close it out with our next two questions which are related um, from Sean and Roy who want to know what the first steps in starting their BYOD strategy and who they contact in starting that are. So yeah, first step uh, starting the BYOD strategy is a policy, right? Right, you, you, you have policy, we go into organizations and there's lots of technology discussions, whether it's uh, um, access and authentication, um, mobile device management, um, device profiling, those types of things, but the policy has to drive um, the conversation. Because then the technology, so what, you know, we mentioned capabilities, so what's the policy around these things that I'm gonna do? We have to answer those and then what are the capabilities I wanna deliver? That supports one of them. Who does support, right? Um, so you have to have your security folks involved with that. And that's a workshop that we offer, quite frankly. I'm doing one in a couple of weeks with a, a team um, to answer those questions, right? Especially around security and risk, because you got to understand those, those devices are falling into and out of compliance with whatever your current policy may be. And, it, and, and they may, quite frankly, they don't always match up. So you got to start with that, that policy around what do I want to deliver, what capabilities do I want to deliver? How do I want to deliver it? And then all the technology will just follow it, right? And instead of starting with the end result, you know, technology, and I'm going to go put this thing in, maybe not what you need. As far as who you contact, um, it depends on, you know, there's, I would fill out the uh, information on, on, on our line and we'll get an account manager um, in touch with you. You know, we have 100 or so account managers across the country. So it just depends on what area of the region you're in. But I would start with them. Good question. Great. Thank you both so much. So I think that about does it for our program today. If we didn't have time to get your, to your question or if you have follow-up questions for a core BTS representative, um, use that scheduling module at the bottom right-hand side of your screen and schedule that follow-up conversation. Thanks again, Jeff and Ed, and thank you everyone for attending. Yep. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye. Thank you.